Hello, everybody. Can you can you hear can you hear me okay? Absolutely, yes, we can. Bill. Awesome. Yes. Very exciting. Yeah. Excited to be here. Yeah. Um, started. Uh, all right. Looks like we have a couple more minutes. But um, so, uh, how, what do you think of the speed networking or speed networking dating? Pretty interesting, huh? Indeed, I popped in and out, but I did not uh, stay for bed. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so let's get started. Um, Excellent. Uh, very, very, very uh, happy to be here and excited uh, to have this. Uh, I'm going to call it an international discussion. And uh, my name is Bill Nottingham. I'll be your moderator for uh, the next uh, uh, session. And um, I'm joined here by Liliana from Tata Consumer Products and Daniel from the Holt International Business School. And we are here for GE Connects, and we're going to talk about innovation. You know, we got the, we got the best topic, don't we? Indeed. Um, so uh, just so you know, uh, you know, please uh, submit questions in the chat window. Uh, raise your hand, and uh, we'll, we'll definitely select some to join into the group. Um, but just to, to kind of level set the agenda, we're going to each, uh, I'm going to give an introduction, and then Daniel will give an introduction. And then we'll have a bit of a panel discussion, and uh, you know, definitely add some comments in there. Uh, Liliana will present herself and her uh, company, and then we'll continue with the panel and uh, make an open dialogue. But uh, please, please feel free to interact. It'll make it a lot more fun. So, so uh, introduce myself, uh, Bill Nottingham. Uh, we have a company called Nottingham Spurk, and um, we are in Cleveland, Ohio, in the United States. Uh, we've been in business since 1972, and co-founded by my father and his partner. Uh, about 75 people on staff, uh, everything from user insights to um, industrial design, U, uh, UX design, graphic design, packaging, structural. Um, Mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, we have firmware, uh, sourcing engineering, biomedical engineering, uh, prototyping and sourcing and, and so on. Uh, you know, we really claim to be able to go from beginning to end. Um, you know, innovation, as you know, is very fragile. So we've done everything we can to invent, invest into the capabilities to make sure that, you know, it, it doesn't stay fragile, but it actually gets out of the market because I can probably certainly... Uh, agree with the three the two others here that innovation is uh, uh, great and all but it's nothing until it's in the market and uh, and you know it's funny I, I'm excited about this topic because there's a lot of uncertainty and you know not the greatest news out there this is positive and this is something that I think everybody can rally behind and uh, you know we have the power to change the world through uh, one thing at a time so I'm excited to talk to the two uh, folks here because you know, we're going to get a little dose of um, an international global phenomenon company and uh, international business school and a guy here in the Midwest who is uh, just happy to be here. <laughs> um, so, hey, uh, Daniel, would you like to uh, to uh, introduce yourself, maybe even show a couple slides or I'll leave it to you. Yes, sure. Thank you very much, Bill. Um, I look forward to having this discussion on innovation and the uncertain environment we find ourselves in. I'm going to take a perspective of two different dimensions, one which is focused on the academic side, but the academic side has got um, perspectives that are industry-based and are practical that industry can actually apply and use. So we're keen to have that discussion, and I will um, have this discussion with you guys in one second. I see my slides now. Yeah. Bill, uh, yeah, excellent. So yeah. basically, our top our topic today is one that Lidiana and I have extensively done research upon, and we do that because uh, Lidiana is actively working in Tata, but I'm also interested in this area uh, as an academic. Now, there are two aspects that we actually want to talk about. All businesses have faced, irrespective of the uncertain environment that we find ourselves in. The question is going to be how do businesses future proof through innovation in the face of uncertainty? Now, prior to the pandemic, most businesses faced uncertainty. 
But this uncertainty was anchored in the business models that they were currently running. So there were uncertainty on capital exposure, on business growth, and the different business challenges that most companies face. Having said that, we now face, we now get through a period of uncertainty that is driven by external forces and has to ask companies the hard question on how they'll be able to deal with that uncertainty. I just want to draw your attention to the simple diagram I have here, and I put it with a bit of tongue in cheek, basically, to see whether I can drive some thought in the beginning of this particular presentation. Uncertainty has always lived with us. The question is going to be, how do we continuously evolve ourselves? And how do we, when I say ourselves, I remind, I remind, I'm focused on companies. How do they continuously evolve to meet emerging and changing circumstances in markets? So you can see here that uh, Henry Ford looks at aspects around, I mean, if he had stayed thinking about in his, you know, the status quo would never have reached the innovation aspects of the 1900s that we moved from horses to actually horsepower in vehicles. We then ask ourselves, what is influencing this uncertainty? Now, I have picked up on a few trends, and those trends are trends that I would like us to look at in detail. And I'm going to look at two dimensions. I'm going to look at a two-dimensional aspect. So obviously, there's the impact of digitalization, and this has come to the fore in the current uncertain environment we find ourselves in. But obviously, there are also aspects of reduced barriers of entry. And reduced barriers of entry actually create challenges for what we refer to as mature businesses or what we call incumbent businesses when we are in uncertain times, because that means it gives what I refer to as margin thresholds to disruptors to enter the market. And once those disruptors are able to enter the market because of these reduced barriers, it gives consumers the scope of choice. And as we all know, in uncertain terms, in, in uncertain times, what happens is that consumers become price sensitive, they're looking for wider choice, and that in itself becomes more of a challenge for established incumbent businesses. Obviously, there's an aspect of hyper-segmentation that remains prevalent and understanding how specific segments need to receive specific value such that they're, they're receiving satisfaction and continue to to, to, to invest what I refer to as customer investment with their money by buying specific products. That obviously leads to intense competition and, and that is on cost. And that leads to aspects around um, uh, cost leadership. And most businesses here know that one of the areas that most managers and most CEOs and most CFOs are currently looking at is how to optimize uh, operations to ensure that you build margin thresholds. Obviously, inequality and amid its globalization is, is, and that also deals with both the supply side and the demand side of, of goods and stuff like that, but also uh, environmental stewardship and how we deal with that. We then move on to some of the trends that must be considered in the downturn. Now, you would obviously know that there must be a few aspects. So customers, remember, customers in this downtown are very sensitive, and so, there are indications that there might be a slowdown in, cons in green consumerism. Um, that might mean now uh, organizations that had pivoted towards uh, redefining their businesses, what should they do? There are these questions. I particularly think they should continue in that line of, uh, of ensuring that they go continue to go green within their corporate strategy. But obviously, consumers are also looking for discounts because of the uncertain environment. They're not sure whether they're going to keep their jobs. And that in itself leads to this aspect for greater value from the products that they consume. Sometimes there might be a shift to necessity uh, consumption, and that also is an area of focus. So they also de demand simplicity, so they move away from complexities in, uh, and when I say the demand for simplicity moves, it, it is basically the threshold of the, the, the what a consumer is willing to trade off uh, in terms of their uh, product value that they receive versus the investment, capital investment, uh, uh, in investor capital they provide. Obviously, we have got the discussion around 
affluent consumers, they start uh, ensuring that they're economizing on, on, on what they um, actually spend on. Obviously, there's an inherent decline in confidence in public institutions. And obviously, the aspect around uh, extreme experience is affected. So now the question, the, the, the fundamental question for executives who are on this call or for businesses, the question is going to be, how do you start understanding aspects around this? Now there's this term that I, I, I love to use, which I think is absolutely prevalent. It is uh, creative confidence in the face of COVID-19. So what do we do? Now, I've always said this, that there are different, there are different influences on the different economic downturns. We could not, for example, there are lessons that we could have learned from the economic downturn in 2008, but that was, that was a financial, which was caused by the, 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 bank, by the banking crisis. And that is slightly different from the, from the downturn that we're currently facing, although there might be aspects that are similar. So the question is going to be, that how do we, there, there was a pressure on availability of capital lending. Here, what we have is we have shifts in consumers uh, having to deal with a pandemic that businesses are facing. So aspects around social distancing, ensuring that you're not able to manufacture products because you're not able to adhere to the new policies that are put in place. That in itself goes to the core of some of the operational aspects uh, et cetera, et cetera. And that is where some of the issues might emerge. And I always say that I see different analysis of um, economic downturns. And sometimes this difference is blurred. And I'll, I just thought I'd bring it out here so that some of the businesses can understand the type of responses that they may have in, in, this, in, this, in this pandemic that we face. Obviously, uh, you've got to, I, I believe that innovation and recovery are driven by medium to long-term prediction of risk. And why do I say that? And I'll show you this, I think, uh, as at the tail end of my presentation, is some of the responses that businesses are going to take might be short-term and might fail to look at medium to long-term aspects. So the capital investments in terms of the response to this pandemic might actually be the actual hindrance of the steps to innovate in your business to medium to long term. So I, I think that businesses have got to think carefully about the way they respond to the pandemic and ask themselves, our response today, how does that feed into the new normal after the pandemic? Because that particular question remains fundamental. Businesses that answer it, and we hope we are going to use some of the, uh, some of the answers that, uh, uh, that uh, Liliana brings up later in our discussion, we'll try and address some of these medium to long-term predictions of risk. We then move on to obviously the ability to ensure that we do two things at the same time. And that is fundamental. The question that Gore has got to ask ourselves in this growth dilemma because of that background is how do these big businesses uh, change and, and respond well? So they're faced with two big dilemmas. The first of which is that they look at they ignore these small opportunities. And this small opportunity, what I refer to small opportunities to be more specific, is opportunities that emerge at a lower margin threshold. When I say lower margin threshold, that means in contribution to over revenue, to, to revenue generated by a portfolio or a specific product. Obviously, the reliance on specific accounting matrices, because in this uncertain world, the, the response might not necessarily be one that drives uh, revenue at this time, but it might be one that allows you to remain afloat for you to fight another day. And that is the, different, the difference that might, might lead companies to adopt meaningful responses. Now, some of the solutions, it's not good just to highlight problems. We come up with some of the solutions. And ambextrous business models are basically um, uh, business models that allow organizations to do two things at the same time, to try and manage the core of their business. And the question they've got to ask themselves, because I know that most organizations look to retrench, look to downsize, look to cut costs because they're fighting the exposure on liquidity and stuff like that. However, 
I would always say that organizations need to balance this out of managing the core business because that is a threat from the risks associated with the uncertainty in the pandemic, but also look to drive innovation that is that, that, that would be the future of the organization. Now, this is easier said than done. Most organizations find it extremely complex to do this and justify this not only to themselves, but also to their boards of directors who are the stewards of the capital that they want to invest. So we then move on to a simple model. And this simple model basically analyzes three dimensions. It, it, it analyzes what I referred to, what we refer to as the 70, 20, 10 model. The 70 is your core business. That core business is basically um, what is currently driving your revenues, what is driving your business today. You've got to then look at how you incrementally move into new areas without necessarily putting your business at risk or minimizing the exposure of risk. And you do that through incremental innovation. Obviously, there are other aspects of innovation, the radical innovation or frugal innovation, whereby you're using limited resources to achieve a higher return or based on whatever it is that you have implemented. It then leads us on to the 10%, what we call the transformation area. The transformation area are the innovations that are uncertain, but become the 70% of tomorrow. You, I think Bill was, was kind enough to let us know that he works for a family business. I have conducted research around family businesses from 1620 to today. There are businesses that have survived that transition. And the question you've got to ask yourself is that what was what is prevalent today might not, or what is you, you, you perceive as your core business today, might not be what is the core tomorrow. And this might be shifts in consumer trends. It might be shifts in markets. It might be shifts in the value that is being delivered or is accepted by the consumer base. So that 10% remains the insurance policy of most organizations uh, as they seek to address some of these challenges associated with uncertainty in markets. Obviously, in a, in a pandemic that we're facing like right now, the, 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 the pressure on the 70% is immense. And that is why most organizations might be skeptical about investing or taking risks in the 20 or 10%. And in fact, most organizations might seek to reduce investment in the 10% as they try to, make, to, to protect the 70% core business. So what do we do? We try and grow the core. You, you, you remember the ambextrous uh, aspect, you try and uh, uh, in, uh, grow the core, but you've also got to look to transform that core. That core, you cannot rely on your last best performance. You've got to try and do that incrementally with limited exposure. And there, di there are different practical examples that we shall look at at the tail end of this presentation when Liliana comes with some practical dimensions that are that are being implemented today. Then, as, as, as I said earlier, you'd have to build that core future. And by doing that, you've got to move to that 10% aspect. Obviously, you've got to try and mitigate associated risks. There are risks associated with, uh, and I'll talk about this later. There's obviously pressure on liquidity in downturns, the pressure on liquidity and business models have, have inherent uh, attributes to them. Some of them have been forced to grow the number of business, uh, the number of consumers. They've been forced to grow market share. So they're heavily leveraged on debt. And most of those business models face a lot of pressure once they're engaged in, or once they're faced with uncertainty that is driven by uh, a pandemic like COVID-19. We'll obviously then try and ask ourselves, what adjusted businesses can we set up? What uh, uh, what, what aspects of our business can we move into? And I think that the incremental aspect of this allows for us to move into areas of additional value while maintaining the cost base. If we're able to add additional value, and I know that marketing people say perception is reality. I, 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 I don't, I, I, I like to be more tangible with the value that is being provided by the organization or the business. It allows for that, for that movement into those adjacent businesses. 
And how do you do that? You can do that by analyzing trends. You could offer, and there's small things that you could offer. You could offer wider aspects around convenience. You could offer uh, uh, other aspects around uh, experience of the product. And that would lead to aspects around scenario planning. You build different scenarios. You look at the risk exposure, look at minimum return, and you then try and implement those. Again, we come back to this term that I like using, which is the creative confidence to explore uncertain gaps. And those are usually, I, I refer to them as the delivery gap. The difference between what, what companies believe they're offering in terms of value and what customers believe. I always say to my students, the best way to, to visualize this is always ask, how can I improve my mobile phone? If you say that you would, you'd improve your mobile phone by increasing the battery life, by increasing the, uh, or ensuring that it, the, phone, the screen doesn't crack, that becomes your delivery gap that you could then offer at no additional cost to be able to offer uh, or to move into adjacent markets. I will stop here and say that uh, we'll get into a discussion and I will hand over to Liliana when she, when we finish our discussion. Thank you very much for listening to me. Well, that, that was that was wonderful. Thank you for putting putting that presentation together. Lots of lots of interesting things that I'd love to uh, comment on. I think maybe <clears throat> what we'll start to do is uh, maybe talk about a couple of questions, and maybe we'll lead into some of the points uh, that you brought up. But just for the first thing, I want to I like the concept of building the core future. I like that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Here's something that would be interesting. Um, so, so Liliana, we haven't heard from you yet, um, and I don't want to uh, take a little bit of your steam away from your presentation. But what is what has Tata done as a global company to foster a culture of innovation? And yeah. Yeah, sure. Hello, everyone. And, you know, very, very happy to, to, to be here and you now have the, the opportunity to share with uh, together with Daniel some of the outcome of our, you know, learnings, research and, and the knowledge around innovations and how we think that companies can thrive and, and drive growth. Coming, uh, Bill, to your, your question, um, I think uh, Tata is is a company knowing to, to innovate. If you go back to uh, and look back to the history of Tata Trust and where they started, it was always how can can drive uh, new things, how we can really challenge the market. Uh, you know, being the um, just the first uh, steel company in India, you know, after coming to to the Western world and learn and, and see what is there. Then they brought the, the cars, um, you know, in uh, again in India, so on and so forth. So it was very much at the beginning learning uh, what ha what's happening in the uh, other parts of the world and bring them to to the home country, to India. But uh, then while, you know, India progressed and the company invests quite a lot in academic world, you know, and, and, and basically in research and you know, having quite uh, big research centers, um, not only in India, also in, in other parts of the world and also in, you know, kind of strong cooperation with, uh, with different uh, universities. It was uh, the other way around, you know, taking some of the innovations which had been developed uh, in India and extended, uh, you know, across the board in other countries. Um, I think innovation stays and it's, it's very much rooted into into the company DNA, um, and it's it's very much look uh, it, it's very much about challenging the status quo, looking into what else can we do, how we can we do different, and looking to the consumers, you know. Um, and I think it's also this this idea about um, okay, maybe you are not first, but how you can do something in a better way than the one who done it done it first. Uh, so of course, the, you know, the first entrance, the first launch has a, an advantage as a company, as a brand on, on the start. But I think there is always space to improve, room to improve. You know, it is and how you stretch that that part, and that's building very much. You know, coming to the model Daniel uh, shared to this this twenty percent about how to upgrade that part of your business, which is today stable or in a, in a good place, but tomorrow it definitely become outdated how you keep it relevant, what you need to do, what's the next generation of, I would say tea, you know, because very much the Tata consumer products is rooted into, into tea or uh, hot beverages. What's the next generation of tea? 
Yeah, so what's the, the closest step I can do and always keep this move, you know, it's, it's like a, uh, you know, perpetuum mobile, next step and next step that should come like, you know, and that gives you 90% of the business, which should be in a good shape. And then it is okay, how you, you really shoot for the moonshot, how you really look to the things which are, are beyond your touch in this moment. Yeah, so how we learn from Elon Musk. To, to, to start thinking and, and send people to the to the space for their holiday yeah so um, that's a little bit what, what companies need to, need to do so very honest we think we, there is a lot of work to be done in Tata to, to really be, be at that space to, to, um, to shoot for the moonshots I think we are in a very good space um, in, in really driving these ideas and businesses and, and pushing you know hard to, to grow uh, and keep keep our business relevant um, I think there are good learnings uh, coming also after the current situation where uh, you know, we really need to go beyond this. What are the moonshots? What's the next uh, next movement when you think about drinks, if I'm, I'm focusing on Tata Consumer Products and the, the drink div drinks division uh, of our, our company? Well, it's interesting you said tea because tea is uh, such a, it's a legacy uh, business. I mean, it's, it goes back way back, but but it's a boring category. Sorry, it, it it's could be business. reinvented. It's, there it's, is it's, a moonshot of tea. <laughs> it's it's super boring now. It is one no, of the most not. boring things. <laughs> yeah, very honest. It is because the tea bag is here for four. It had been created forty years ago. It's so convenient. It's so nice and mm -hmm. so easy to use. Uh, and you get the the kind of tea you want. Then why bother? Mm -hmm. But then then being you know being this in this um kind of in the the circle of um being so so easy to use then that's even the, the biggest challenge. What's next? What can you do? How we can engage and get that new things, which will drive a little bit of excitement in this category, because otherwise I'm sure they'll become other drinks, will become more popular and the next generation will not drink tea anymore. Yeah, so the, the, we see this Unless already. Unless we reinvent it, right? Exactly, is there exactly. A, is there a Snapchat <laughs> version, right? Yeah, um, exactly, no, I mean, the honestly... TikTok. What's the TikTok <laughs> of tea? <laughs> well, it, it's funny because, you know, one of the things I've noticed during this uh, stay at home is, um, you know, people aren't eating as healthy as they used to because, you know, there's not it's not very easy to go to Whole Foods or, you know, uh, Tesco or whatever. So, you know, um, you know, healthy is the new thing. And so the theory is we all drink coffee. Tea is a lot more healthy. Yeah. And all we have to do, I love to take things that are seemingly simple and boring into making them a moonshot. You know, it's possible. Um, yeah. You know, uh, very interesting. Uh, so, so Daniel, um, I, I have a thought for you. As a as a professor, what missteps have you seen companies make that that prevent a culture of innovation from truly thriving? You know, what lessons learned? Yes, I think that I've um, I'm, I'm I'm a professor. I've also managed to both at undergraduate and postgraduate, and I've also done consulting. So. It is, it is a good question that you ask, Bill. I think one of the ones that stand out is that the culture of innovation is misunderstood in most organizations. Most organizations say that they're seeking to be innovative, but the culture that they set is one that doesn't foster innovation. And I think that's a misstep that they're, they're taking. Innovation should be embedded in the DNA and the values of the organization for them to be able to drive that innovation. Now, the question they've got to ask themselves is, in fact, most organizations believe that innovation is radical innovation. And they forget that you could make gradual steps in innovating process, brands, um, products. You could even innovate in your profit models, in the models that you allow for your company to actively engage. So, for example, identification of non-consuming customers. Why are customers consuming your product? Understanding that space allows you to, to determine innovative pricing strategies, innovative engagement models. So, for example, you could spread costs and spreading the cost uh, options in purchase. That means you're bringing in a market segment that did not ideally purchase your product in the, in the initial or in the initial offering. So I think if you asked me, that is one of the areas that organizations need to really focus on. It is not necessarily about this radical, crazy, or the seeking of shifting into new markets. I believe that they need to be able to understand and foster so that they're able to build an 
have that 70% core that gives them the foundation to be able to gradually move to the 20 and then look to the to the 10 percent there, there's you know there's no question that you need to have a strong core but sometimes the strong core can kill the future core you know it, it's, yeah. it's that classic you know chicken or the egg you know um, oh, right. you know I, 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 I you know in, in, in you know, as you can imagine and even uh with Liliana you know we're as innovators want to stretch we want to try new things and everybody else is saying we just want to th survive you know <laughs> I think I think that's that's really the challenge, you know, and and the kind of you know uh, I would just bring also my my uh, previous experience in Unilever, where I spent sixteen years working in different brands, you know, and, and uh, the development and and looking onto innovation in personal care and different other categories, and I think that's that's indeed always the the stretch and the easiest thing it is to stay in the comfort zone and do the smallest step next next to you, and that's that's what's happening, especially in the big companies, very very honest, um, because there is the fear of failure. Because always, whenever you you fail, you fail big. If you if you go there, you know, and and take this mindset of a big company, I think what you need to to basically balance very nicely and start embedding into a big company it is a new mindset. Uh, this uh, the startup ways of thinking probably sounds like a, an overused uh, you know kind of terminology, but that's true and that's real, and I think that's that's make a lot of sense in my view. So bring this this startup way of thinking, be agile, and and allow people. To do things different, um, but how how you can do this? You cannot do this with the whole part of your business. That's why you need to have that ten percent. On I can can go even further, but at the list of ten percent, allow people to put their focus on energy on new things. You know, create space for them to experiment, create space for them to to cre be creative. You know, to uh, give them the confidence that you really respect their ideas and and allow them to also implement it. Use it at a smaller scale. You know, that thing test. Test and learn, you know, test and learn continuously uh, and come with new things which basically can can really bring these this, this new things or allow you to discover. And I think probably another thing here it is allow failure. Mm -hmm. Companies are, um, you know, because again, in a big company and I learned this quite, you know, quite a lot and experienced this a lot through my career, um, it's, it's hard to fail or accept failure. Again, if you want to really get something completely innovative, different, uh, you know, really, really out of the box, you need to, to experiment and, and go out of your comfort zone as a business. Yeah, so that's why you need to stretch. You need to allow some smaller teams. You need to, to create some, you know, kind of scum teams or whatever, name it. Allow some people, the most creative ones, allow them to experiment, empower them to take decisions and do things different, and then see how you can slowly bring uh bring new things out uh, from the outside world inside and i think another um another point would be probably very much about uh, how companies can work together how basically the enemies become friends you know how competitors can work together and and to towards next generation of of whatever that's going to be and I think that what we live today, you know, and the, when we see companies working together to, to create a new vaccine against, you know, COVID-19, it's an example. And I think this can go also on a smaller scale and can be implemented in, at different levels. You know, if you really want to disrupt an industry, probably it's very hard sometimes for one single company because of resources, because of different reasons, how you take and, and put, you know, part, create partnerships within an industry, within a, a, an area, within a category to drive, you know, this the, this next step. A next step, as Danielle said, it doesn't mean to be, um, you know, the, the new SpaceX or the new rocket sent to the, to the moon. It can be something else. It can be the new business model. It can be the new way of interacting with consumers. We have so much challenge now about how we can connect with people, uh, being, you know, everybody in their houses. There are m many, many ways we, which we find out in connecting with the people, and we talk a little bit more uh, about this later on. That's great. You said a, a bunch of really interesting things. I love the idea of um, allowing for failure. You know, there's a, a really interesting company here in the States uh, um, called X. It's a division of Google, and I always like to uh, look at what they're doing. I, I see a lot of similarities into what we do at Nottingham Spurk, what they do at Google, only they have a little bit more in funding. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, they celebrate failure. They truly Correct. celebrate failure. And it's uh, there's a great article in uh, the Atlantic on Google X. A little sneak peek into them if you want to 
search that out. You can Google it. Um, oh, okay. Uh, but I also love the concept of disrupting an industry together because you're right. It's like, you know, when retail, you know, you want to come out with a singular product, but to really make a difference, you almost have to have a, an end cap or um, a, a, a product line. So it's, I can almost anal uh, relate that to a company. To disrupt an industry, you have to have companies to do that. You need to create a whole new thing. So in a way, you want to have solid competition so that you both, you know, grow. And that's, that's really neat. Um, so here's an interesting question. Uh, if you had unlimited resources, what innovation would you champion? Get uh, unlimited potential money, like a Google X. What, what would you uh, What would you champion to be the next I, big I, thing? I, I would let Daniel. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, no, I could. I, if you want, I could go yeah, first. Yeah, Daniel, why don't you take Daniel, this? One? Yeah, yeah, let me yeah. let me go first, and I would like I'd allow Liliana to have a think of uh, what you'd say. I think that just building on what uh, we, we were said here, the journey towards failure leaves traces of success. And those are some of the areas that allow for what we refer to as predictive success. You, you, build, you build aspects that allow you to create market shifts. So just building on what Liliana said, if I was an industry leader and had unlimited resources, I would create an open source platform that allowed for the sharing of ideas that drew, that that was in, that was a drive so this open source would allow for the for the for the driving of new ideas that would then feed into the industry and then organizations would compete at delivering of this differentiating it in the in the way they, they provide the service or the experience to the consumer now most people might think that I have lost the plot or that I'm not thinking about, but this is a model that has been used by large industries. So for example, if you look at the oil industry, ask yourself, where do they start competing? They start competing once the end product is in the gas station, but at every other point, they have, they're, they're, they're seeking to work together and, and consolidate and consolidate their business. That's a good and, analogy. Yes, and consolidate their business models. Now, if we, were to get, if we were to get organization, if I had unlimited resources, if I was, for example, uh, your company, Bill, uh, Sp uh, uh, Nottingham Spark, I, is, 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 that how, is that how it's pronounced, Nottingham Spark? Or I, would, I, would, I, would, I would drive this area of open innovation that allowed for this creation of ideas and, and, and it would cut across a few industries. So the the, 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 there's one industry that I've been looking at with a lot of interest. The pet industry is one of the is one of the biggest industries today that exceeds the robotics industry. That is somewhat that, that I had not found out and found this out through research. Uh, I think it is bigger than it by almost two twofold in terms of it's, it's unbelievable, and 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 that is that is what that is what is is, is interesting. So I would use that particular. That particular drive, I can see Jonathan saying that he can't hear. I hope he can hear me now. I've just increased my volume to make sure that you're able to hear me. So I, that's what I'll do. I'll, I'll move to this predictive open source model that I'll allow. Very interesting. And how about you, uh, Liliana? Would you like to contribute? Uh, yeah, no. So I think um, probably I'll be a bit more, more pragmatic. Definitely. Um, you know, building on this, uh, the, the idea open source. Um, I think it's very much to, um, as a company, when think of innovations to link it with, with people. Yeah, so then then I would um, probably, if I would have, uh, you know, kind of uh, unlimited resources, I will make sure I spend enough time, me and my team, with people and understanding their needs and their problems to be able to come with solutions. Uh, and in the you know to satisfy their their specific problems, I think that's and that's that's probably one thing which there is a a little bit of disconnect between between innovation and you know kind of and product or idea of the product and whatever is coming at the end. It's the disconnect between product and consumer need, you know. And starting many times, companies do start from developing product, which may be super creative, something you know fantastic and amazing. But at the end of the day, you realize it doesn't fit anywhere. Nobody needs it, you know? So that's the main reason of a failure. So basically, if I will have, you know, um, a lot of, you know, resources, I would say, I will spend in understanding people, understanding their problems, 
um, and, and understanding their needs and not the, uh, the whatever they declare because you know there is a big difference between what people do need yeah, and what everything. they say they need yeah <laughs> <laughs> so stay, stay stay spend time and understand that part and i think that's that's a little bit tricky many times into into the consumer understanding and the research part you know so then we go um many times quite superficial in in the race of creating the product you know and running to to deliver something and putting immediately on the market rather than than um start and, and really go and, and test and understand how that we can basically um, satisfy and develop this in a better way. And I think Amazon is an example. What they are doing, it is always um, experimenting, starting, you know, at the smaller scale, putting the products, you know, um, on, on their platform, uh, trying to, you know, selling, exposing to the, to the consumers, getting learnings on board and, and kind of refining up until it's something which can go broadly and why uh, and wider so um but taking out all that that learnings and doesn't that doesn't necessarily mean you need to have a lot of money for example you know because um again i'm thinking from resources of broader perspective not just money yeah, yeah so resources people. means people exactly so and i think that that's the big challenge you have many times in the companies so you may have budget available but you may not have people able to have you know um that's that um space in their mind because there is a lot of pressure of moving quickly, quickly, faster in delivering things. They don't have that space of mind where they can really be creative and can spend time to understand and, and really get, get at the root of the insight, right? get that, that really nugget which makes a difference. Yeah, I, I love that. Uh, well, first of all, very unexpected. I thought both of the answers were really interesting. Um, you know, it, it's really neat. You're truly innovators because if you had unlimited resources, you're like basically saying, I need more people. I need the right people. I need the, you know, it, it's, it's very interesting. You know, I always liked, uh, there's a great book um, called, called Good to Great. And they say you have to get the right people on the bus. And, mm -hmm. you know, at our firm, we try to hire the best. You know, we, we need to have the right people because we're small. And, and I think that, um, you know, you don't just have a ton of people. You have to have the right people. You know, and um, and a variety of people. You know, diversity of, of uh, background, um, of different. Uh, you know, where they're where they're from, uh, levels of education. Uh, you know, maybe not quite perfect fits. You know, um, and uh, very interesting. I, I think uh, you know one of the things that I I, I like to say during the stay at home or pandemic, um, there are quite a few silver linings. Unfortunately, I mean, in an unfortunate situation, I kind of like to look at the glass half full and I've noticed a lot of silver linings, but um, and one of it was technology. You know, I, I'm, uh, I always like to consider myself the ultimate beta tester. You know, I'm a, I go to CES every year, you know, it's, um, you know, it, it's, it's all about, you know, trying new things. But what I'd like to ask you is, um, have you enabled any new technologies that weren't in place before the pandemic? Um, yes. What we have done at home is that we, First of all, we're extremely proud at home that we are a business school that is extremely innovative, not just in, in, in what we say, but in what we do. We changed our format of delivering to our students within two weeks. And I do some work at a certain other uni British university that has, that, have, that has failed to do that. Actually, we at that university, we're having to start in September. Uh, so we're, we're asking students just to deliver work online. So what we did at Holt is that we immediately went on to provision of, of, of um, lectures online. Um, that was done and communicated to our students. This transition was seamless. However, we had to think very carefully about how do we move into the fall term that starts in September? How, what type of offering are we going to have? And we have come up with this hybrid model of continuous learning, whereby we're using artificial intelligence in class for lecturers to be able to deliver to, uh, to students both in class, but also off-site. And what is happening is that this investment is already happening. We are already testing it. We have moved to the delivery. Now, the key part about this was very fundamental. And the good thing about HOT is that they involve faculty in their thought process in how they're going to implement and deliver this. So the question was, 
how do we invest in technology driven by artificial intelligence um, cameras with, with wear lanyards? And when you move, the cameras follow you. They're picking up on the, Ooh, interesting. the, on the sound. Yes, they're, 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 they're whiteboards that students can, can, can provide uh, their thoughts on, which is then beamed and shared onto the, the, the professor's laptop in class. So all that technology, the question then was, post-COVID, how do we use this? Well, and, I'm never going to throw and, that all away and just do classrooms. Exactly. <laughs> I'm throw all that away. Because, and, and, and to me, it offered us a different dimension of delivery. So it offered us a different business model, a different pricing model, a different access to markets. All that we need, basically is individual students to have access to the internet for them to be able to have access to our content. Same professors, same. So, and, and we could even share that resource with actual classes. So in other words, you don't have to have two Daniels. Daniel can be teaching in class and this could be bigged around. Not, not around. yet at least. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> Daniel, the virtual avatar that will live exactly. <laughs> Yes. So that is that is that is what we are currently. That's what we're currently doing. But it is it, it speaks to the organization having the as you rightfully said having the right people in place to be able to have the ability to move these innovations in a meaningful manner and implementing them without fear of exposure to specific risks. Very cool. Maybe just just one one small build because also I'm I'm teaching at half Daniel. So I think the basically the, the key insight was there. Um, yeah, how we can basically still be relevant to the students and especially to the one who will not be able to travel to London. Yeah, so start for a very simple to my point earlier insight. You know, there'll be people from either financial reasons because you know. Um, parents cannot support further, you know, to, to pay for their studies or so on and so forth, uh, or, you know, come to the real London or f f health reasons, you know, they, they may be other a uh, higher risk, so they cannot travel, but still they want to study, you know, how can we offer them the opportunity um, to, to continue study that, that on one hand, on the other hand, of course, you have the ones who want to continue their studies in, uh, in a normal way. They want to still to live their student life. Yeah. So, how we can basically can can ban, um, can uh, create these two these two things and offer the the best experience for the students at the end of the day. So you know and really adjusted, sorry, adjusting to their specific needs. You know and 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 deliver the the best experience which fits in their uh, in their needs. Very um, I think then maybe just just building uh, to to the uh, to this point. Um, also for us was a, was a very a very quick transition. Uh, we we had to to move everything and move online. Uh, working sorry, working from home uh, in like a, a week or so. Um, and I have to say, company at least at least the branch here in London was not necessarily very well prepared. You know, uh, I have to say it was um, the the working from home. Um, option was not very much rooted into the company like like it, it had been before in some other companies you know so still it was a company where where people prefer to be in the office and also there's some part of the of what we do uh we, where we require people to be in the office yeah so basically uh, my colleagues from from tea buying and blending they need to taste like hundreds of teas per day so you cannot do this really from home you need to be there <laughs> and you need to have the teas and you need to have a certain way to to brew the teas and there there is a whole procedure so a little bit difficult to get it at home, you know, to really get, get you know, the, the nuggets. What we succeed to do, it is really to move everything uh, online. Of course, some of the of my colleagues, you know, from, from these departments, for, for example, from R&D, had to go from, from time to time to office to do some, some of the tests. But what we succeed to do, it was launch a brand while we've been in uh, um, working from home. So basically, really? we had did a, you do this? Yes, exactly. It wow. is the good, Gooders, Gooders brand. Uh, we have it in US. It's a tea brand. It's an absolutely amazing brand. It's it's a US brand created in California in 1972. So we launched it and extended this into UK market. Uh, so it was planned to be launched in um, in March. Uh, so uh, basically, that was you know a lot of things going with with a lot actually end of March, beginning of, of April. Uh, through, you uh, know, and the, the moment of launch had been linked with um, Coffee Festival at the beginning of, of April, a big, big event happening here in London where all the, you know, everybody's going, it's a place, you know, you need to be there. Of course, the pandemic came. And all yeah, the so goes that idea. 
<laughs> Not only that idea, the whole launch, it, it was because oh. it's an experiential brand. Yeah. So you, the teas oh. had been created in such a way you have to see them. You have to see them brew because that's everything. You have kombucha as a, as a ready to drink proposition. Again, has the, the launch as an event. It was an experience because that's the brand about. So it was immediately after this plant, a big, big, a big launch event, you know, with a lot of, of um, activities and events happening everything you know kind of okay nothing moved moved further so basically what we had to do it is to step take a step back and see how can we continue so first question was do we continue or not with the launch said a brand like others with a proposition you know uh, what that that brand is coming the products which will be delivered do fit very well with with the new trends with this idea of, of health and wellness because are very you know they're very much this um healthy teas and herbal teas different nice of, of amazing mixes um so is that okay definitely we have to continue and, and and bring it to launch took a little bit longer so we had to delay a little bit the launch to to the beginning of may and move everything into um all the activities online so first of all uh, we continue the partnership with Sainsbury, so that was was really great. It is one one chain retailer here in London. Um, we, despite you know they changing completely their models and the way they operate and had to push all the launches later on. So then basically succeed to work together to make yes. sure that yes we deliver the for the deliver the product. <laughs> Uh, you know the factory produce and you have them products shipped and, and moving around second they reach the shelves and then they they get into the shelf in the proper way but also we moved everything else in terms of uh, the rest of distribution but also communication we move it online so um th that you know rethink the whole campaign in in four weeks to to adjust it and and launching online looking now to the results after four five weeks already since in the market it it's doing brilliant because the brand itself it, it's so so great uh so um i'll say yes it can be done uh it's uh, there is a lot of you know there are a lot of learnings we take from from this one and um uh, we will take it further in the way we do things from future now, now what's the brand called again good earth good earth well yes. that, that's definitely very timely isn't it Exactly. Um, now, I, I haven't been, um, you know, it's funny, I haven't been to Europe in uh, maybe you know, in, in the past 12 months. Do you have Uber Eats or? Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. What, what do you have? Uh, is it Uber Eats? Yeah, yeah. Uber Eats okay. exists and also there are different other um, options. Other in the, yeah, uh, yeah. It, did, you, did you end up doing a partnership with them? <laughs> Uh, no, <laughs> no. But we used a lot um, the um, the online space, uh, and also, for example, we had to create our um, D two C model very quickly. It yeah. was planned to come on a, on a slightly later phase. Uh, you know, it was the the phase two. So we need to accelerate uh, our D two C model and make it available. That was another way to make available uh, the product knowing that consumers move to shopping online. So um, it's, you know, we need to have the product accessible. So uh, that, that was- uh, Wow, was, that, yeah. now that is a cool story. I hope you're like, uh, your PR company hears that, you know? <laughs> yeah. so, um, that's very cool. I, I, that's the first brand that I'm aware of that's launched in the pandemic. So that's, yeah. really, that's, that's really interesting. Uh, you know, it's, it's funny, you think about, um, I hear a lot of, uh, companies talking about preparation, you know, and um, I do know that this pandemic will be teaching us things in the future because um, you don't know what's going to happen. But, you know, one thought that I had is for both of you and uh, maybe maybe Daniel will start with you. Um, you know, what what events in the past do you feel have prepared you for what's going on now? I mean, I'm sure there aren't things that necessarily compare, but what's happened in the past that might have helped you? be more ready now? Well, just before I joined the academic world, I used to work for actually all the three big logistics companies. Um, so I worked for TNT, I then moved to FedEx, and then uh, DHL had hunted me, and I rose to sales manager at DHL. However, one of the biggest challenges that we faced at DHL was when, uh, and, and I knew it was coming because I'd just come from FedEx, mm -hmm. <laughs> is when FedEx had just introduced the 9 a.m. guarantee uh, product. Mm -hmm. And that was one that was going to affect 
the, one of the biggest market segments that we had, which was the financial sector. So we used to move a lot of documents in the financial sector to New York for clearing and all that. Now, what FedEx had done is that FedEx had tapped into this by offering additional value and had even tied something called a money back guarantee. Now, this business model has, been, fast forward, this was in the 90s, fast forward, this is now being used by Amazon with their Prime. Of course. Uh, by, yeah, yeah, so exactly. <laughs> so one of the biggest challenges was how to have or to build an aspect of resilience in the way you respond to the aspects associated with intense competition. So, for example, in, in the current pandemic right now, you've got institutions like Holt that have fast-tracked some of the investments that they had previously thought about doing in the next five to seven years, five, four, three to seven years to implement them now. And we're seeing tremendous success in how it has opened up new markets. So for example, we're able to go into the Middle East and Africa to be able to see how we can respond to those market needs. So for me, I think the having dealt with some of these uncertain uh, issues in practice in, in through corporate organizations had, had, ha, has allowed me and my contribution into some of the discussions that we had at Holt in, in making this transition. But also not only that, I'm currently doing some consulting with a company in Sweden. I will not mention it just because there might be a few of the executives on the call who might read it <laughs> and I signed the confidentiality. And they're saying... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I signed that confidentially. But, 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 but they are thinking about making a transition. And unlike Tata and Liliana, we held back on launching what we were, we were going to launch because it was a huge shift from their core product. It was a huge shift. So they're moving into construction and they're known for something else. They're known for... Um, consumable products. So, so, so they're moving into provision of real estate and stuff like that. And it was, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was an interesting transition because I said to them, look, the plan remains as is. We are not exposed, you know, our, our risk exposure is very minimal. Um, so we, we see how things pan out. And as soon as uh, the contractors are able to get back on two site, we, we move with phase one of the project. So. The ability to remain calm in, in, in these advice is, is fundamental, especially for, for, for the chief executives and decision makers in organizations to be able to make the right call. You know, I, I love what you said there, because I always say that sometimes your not to do list is more important than your to do list. And timing is everything right. because, you know, to, to Liliana, she got lucky. I mean, that was uh, yeah. that made sense. But, you know, yeah. sometimes hold your cards back. You know, it's very interesting. I, I, I'd love to I'd love to move on here into the agenda um, just to let everybody know uh, we're going to go through a little presentation from Liliana and then we'll open it up to some questions in the chat. And then some of you uh, uh, in the audience that uh, or the virtual audience, um, mm -hmm. we might bring up uh, on the screen and you could ask your question in person. So um, just raise your hand through the little platform here. But Liliana, would you like to take the screen and show some things? All right, I yeah. think I'll just bring this up. Can you see this? Thank you, Daniel. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, yeah, if we can put the presentation, that will be great. Uh, are you, can you see that? No, no, not yet. We just see a screen, which is nice. We see ourselves. Oh, but the, oh, okay. but we the see presentation may be. Ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> the presentation may be a little bit more helpful. <laughs> now, in the meantime, of course, if there's some some other questions from uh, anybody in audience, please just just type them on the on the chat. Uh, you know, around the, uh, the the innovation piece and and what exactly uh, or what we discussed up until now. So I'd say my um, what I wanted to share with you uh, is a little bit around innovations. Yeah, we start already the conversation around this and how we can can drive. You've seen, yes, in a business, they count um, already sometimes for, for only 10%. But I think that, that it is a, a very important 10% in the economy of the business. So maybe before this, uh, a little bit of context. So if you look what's going on, I probably don't need to, to tell you much more about the environment, the global environment, and the whole uncertain framework we live in today, which basically it's, it's even more uncertain day by day, you know, everything changing from, from one day to another. But what we see, and it's really, really fundamental, and I, uh, Daniel, 
can we go back please um so what i wanted to to highlight uh very much it is the uh, basically like few few big trends which um been quite we've seen it before this pandemic but i think they're getting even bigger as as we we go to 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 the new normal as it's called nowadays yeah so what we see we see basically people uh, really being more empowered we see we see more empowered humans really taking responsibility uh, and you know taking um um uh, taking you know a, a stand against something which which they don't feel confident and they don't believe in or they don't relay with so um but on the other and also on the other hand we see people um kind of taking um, and doing some different activities uh, which which support their purpose, their direction, you know, and this idea of, of purpose, what unmeaningful um, actions is becoming more and more important. Beyond this, I would, I would want to highlight two big trends, um, which which I'm sure will stay at the, at the base of innovations in, in the future, and that that can go across different industries. But if we talk about, um, very, uh, if you focus on the food and beverages industry, definitely will be very much embedded into that ones. And these are this idea of um, you know the um, health and wellness. What what exactly means? And I think that's becoming even more more relevant. The naturalness um, and and how this can be brought to life. How are we going back and use that kind of product, which are very much rooted into uh, into the you know and deliver uh, into the. Uh, the real goodness uh, of uh, of the of the nature or whatever they can come, but at the same time, how we can become more mindful the way uh, in the way we consume the resources we have. And I would say, uh, from this perspective, the sustainability it's it's get, getting a new dimension. So with all this this in mind and all the all these changes, basically we see the people becoming more um, uh, kind of empowered and. Uh, um, basically they're, they're becoming more engaged in everything what is happening on around them and also at the same time uh they're getting more and more engaged we've seen the the fragmentation happening you know the consumer getting more you know the, the market and everything becoming hyper fragmented uh and then basically we we see the people really taking control um and i think i think in this space basically attention of the of the people is a uh, it's a reward. It's it's not something you would expect. So that's why you really need to be mindful and be, need to be meaningful to uh, whatever is happening. So if we can go further, Daniel, please. Uh, so then um, basically, um, and this is, is very much, you know, coming through across the board. If you look what's going on in the industry, as, as also Daniel mentioned, it's not just about bringing new products. That's not, not in, uh, innovation. We see a lot of challenges happening in the market. Um, and uh, and kind of different businesses challenging the the uh, how the existing business do operate on one hand, but also what's what's going on there, the preference of the consumers, and really building and coming up with new ideas. Um, either it's about uh, you know the the industry pathways, that's the pricing models. So basically, what used to be a certain type of pricing, a certain structure does does not exist anymore there, there are different ways to look to the pricing and uh and it's very important for the companies in this context to link the pricing with the value so people are looking to the value i'm getting out of the product rather to how much i pay it and i think this will become even more important and more relevant in in the world we live and we are going to live in after the you know the the current um situation which will lead to the the company's the need to create new business models yeah, so definitely, and that's, this we see it also today happening when uh, when you know this movement from from a, a distribution uh, using the brick and mortar was coming to 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 start was was start building it you know towards the e-commerce was moving slowly towards e-commerce. This had been accelerated, you know. So that that's what's next. And I'm you now we as a companies, we as innovators, we start thinking what is is next because everything is being questioned as we as we uh, now as we live in as we move further as we go to the to the new normal so with this we really need to to see what's next we need to to move further and try to understand what can a company deliver and how can engage with the consumers further you know what companies can do and i think building um you know sharper and and, and new and and really um disruptive innovations is is a good way to answer to this one and looking to uh, to this um, to these new things to to come to bring into the market and how we can do this basically it is really defining these innovation gaps you know uh, which are sitting at the at the intersection of 
what people need, you know, the consumer need, and, and I'll probably repeat a few times this, but I think it's so fundamental for a business. Um, looking to what is the business feasibility, what business can do, and how can stretch beyond the obvious, beyond the core of that part of the business. What technology exists, and what, what are the feasibility from technological point of view, but also is about social responsibility how companies can be more social responsible, how people can be more social responsible. So I think in the moment when we, we put all these four areas together, we really find that that kind of clear, clear areas to generate um, innovations. But and I'm saying here, you know, real innovations, because it clearly define the, the innovation gaps into, into the market. So um, I think that's that's one thing, and then this definitely should be combined uh, and have at the at the, at the base um, clear consumer behavior understanding. You know, and behavior um, um, psychology is is it's a you know it's a science which been created lately, but I think it's so important. And we as as marketeers, we as you know uh, people working into into the space of innovation, do really need to to use this uh, this more to make sure we generate this uh, insights relevant insights which help us to drive uh, and disrupt the, the you know the, the market and create disruptive innovations um, definitely is uh, because using this one we can it can can apply and create then product or or kind of solutions which can help us move move further so if we move further then yeah um, Talked a bit about the, the consumer behavior understanding. Uh, can we stay a little bit? Can we go back, please? So uh, talking about consumer understanding, definitely there, there are many ways of, of doing, uh, doing this. Um, but just, just want to highlight the need of getting close to the people, the need of really talking with them on continuous base, um, connect and, and make sure you really, really get to understand what it is. And you can do it in, in many ways. And I would say, uh, the virtual space and the online space and social media and other other ways of doing do offer us a lot of possibilities. Maybe we are not able today to go and uh, you know talk directly with people as as we used to be, um, but still there are many other ways when you can connect directly. And so and I, um, the virtual um, part do allow us to do this. And I would say the other um, important. Um, part it is uh, there are focus groups and whatever this kind of research is gone so they are different you know you need to move further as a company and try to engage closer with the people uh, you know uh, to to be able to to connect and get that rich insights which can go to the innovations based on this basically uh, with with daniel we work a lot and, and are using the some design thinking uh, theories and design thinking ideas which i would recommend uh, to to everyone to to be used because this these are are starting from uh, really thinking to the to the market context. So if you go to the next slide, Daniel, please. Um, so if we look to the to the market context and have a good understanding of the context, combined with a good understanding of what people want, you know, on the inside, this allow us to get that really excellent nuggets of innovations, you know, which then then can build towards some some products or solutions. I would call it to be broader, you know, can be services or can be something else. Um, which can translate it you know, further in, in really disruptive business models or disruptive proposition in the market or disruptive pro um, product, which will, will allow satisfying the, the, this consumer needs in the in best way possible. So um, I would say, again, one, one point and one thing which, which I think makes sense as innovator was as person working within the marketing in the innovation space, um, have a look to design thinking techniques. I have, I have Try to apply this one. Use the market understanding, combine uh, consumer consumer thinking and consumer behavior understanding. Put these two things, and this will allow you to really get get strong insights and and solutions, which will uh, allow you to to disrupt the market. And basically, further on, I would like to share with you some some few examples from different areas on how how really taking this uh, this way of new way of thinking you can drive that kind of products and solutions which can disrupt the, the market. So, um, well, no, no, as I said, there are two, two areas, you know, two big trends. Uh, one, it is around engagement and technology, and the other, it is around uh, real and authentic and holistic, which is very much into this health and wellness space. So zooming into uh, engagement, engagement and, and technology, basically there, there are a few examples on, on how this, uh, you know, the, the um, 
thinking and, and insights had been translated into to great solutions or great proposition. So, for example, we want customized beverages, uh, and you want to get it uh, sometimes as at, at, at the click of your phone. So, uh, I think the you know we see here an example of um, translated in uh, by Pepsi of this this you know customized beverages solution or machines which will allow you to get the drink in you know that kind of drink you want um personalization is another big trend you know so how companies can deliver against personalization for for us again for for tea that's a big challenge how we can really try to create and allow people to create that kind of tea they want you know that kind of test and mix of the strengths they they want to get rather than get to something which is standardized Another part, which um, another uh, important uh, area of innovation is around packaging and moving from, um, you know, recyclability to reusability. So because, again, if we think of the impact on the planet, um, by reusing, you reduce fundamentally significantly the impact of, of the packaging of your product on, on the planet. And here I would like to give the loop example. I don't know, uh, probably in US, you are, it's, it's more uh, better known, uh, but in Europe, it's, it's just entering in the market, and there are also some other companies um, playing into this space. Basically, their idea it is to use a, a packaging solution 400 times. So basically, you get your product, you use the content, then you return the the, the packaging, which go, is going to be you know uh, cleaned to to facility to be cleaned. And then it's going to the supplier again, and then it's getting refilled. So basically, you kind of use this, and this has a, a big impact in, um, you know, to also to the profitability of the company. So if you think the cost of packaging, hundred times or cost of packaging once versus investing in in a packaging, uh, you know, in, in such a packaging solution, definitely, you know, the the, um, the equation, the financial equation will look uh, quite quite good into to the space of. Um, of the you know getting such such kind of solution e-commerce uh i would say it's growing we we as a company need to find solutions to really deliver that kind of product uh through the post uh you know post box or to get it home and here it's an example of some uh, a bottle of wine which had been created in such a way to be delivered to the uh to the post box Probably the French people will be like, will have a heart attack, you know, looking to this bottle, which is, you know, of course cannot be a uh, glass bottle, will be a, a, a different materials. But that's that's the way we are moving into, yeah? So we need also to, to see how we can combine the trends and the tradition. And that's the challenge innovators and innovations do bring into the market, you know, keeping still the, the tradition, keeping the authenticity but building the innovation piece into uh, into the, um, the the innovation um, the new thing the technology the new technology into the innovation part and i would say probably another example is around this new format in terms of packaging uh, and and i really love the the solution you know proposed by Carlsbeck and and they start to experimenting for for their brand uh, which um, actually is is around um, a, a new sustainable uh, fiber paper bottle uh, definitely making sure that will resist, you know, kind of for a, a bit longer time and you get the whole properties and preserve the properties of the of the beer when, when you get it. Uh, but it's something easy to recycle, also can be reused uh, and can, can be further utilized. So um, I would say innovations is, again, start from consumer understand. So they want something personalized, how we can personalize a product and personalization can go beyond just just putting a name on the product or something yeah so deliver it in the in the best way possible in the moment when somebody need it uh, and the other examples i want to bring you uh, to you are, are into this space of health and wellness again health and wellness is, is a very broad topic and everybody is talking nowadays about health and wellness but what does this mean when we talk about products it means really getting that that kind of product which have um, natural ingredients, you know, single-minded, back, going back to nature, getting the essence of some products in the moment when you, you talk about flavors, you know, and being authentic to that flavors, you know. When you talk about strawberry flavor, make sure that's a strawberry flavor uh, in, and you get that, that product, you know, really, really authentic. But also experiment and try to create new new options, you know, new new solutions which can deliver against you know a, a, can deliver a different benefit so if somebody is looking you know more into the i don't know calming space how you can obtain 
uh, more relaxation type of uh, of mood, for example. You know, what kind of product ingredients can deliver that kind of thing? If you want something easy to use on the go, how what kind of products can fit in that specific need? You know, uh, and that then we go to the formats. Then then you go to experimentation, bringing something new and different. And I would say um, definitely is is about how we can live closer to the people and understand you know we are looking to all this movement and and here it's an example of, of um, you know uh drink uh, drinks you know soft drinks brand which which went into this space of creating a tea which answering the specific needs but um i'm very big fan uh, fan of ben and jerry brand i think it's it's brilliant they do you know it's it's really absolutely um great the, the way how they are taking a, a certain movement, a certain situation, and really, really bring it into it, through the product closer to the people, you know, in a, in a meaningful way. Uh, it's not, not superficial because they've always been on the front line of different movements, other, other that's about LGBT movements, other that we talk about, you know, um, Black Lives Matter uh, type, of, type of movement and any other. So basically, they always take a stand towards justice you know so definitely how you link this in a more me in a meaningful way the product and i think that they're doing quite quite well and that's another another example you, you know it's so, interesting not to interrupt you but it's interesting about the ben sure. and jerry's um it's it's owned by unilever correct yes yes and, yes and they're still able to capture that essence even though it's within a bigger firm yeah, that's that's a, that's an example um, on you know in terms of how we can manage acquisitions when you talk about brands and and when we talk about businesses and how a big company by doing acquisition has two options out no many but I think two are mostly used one it is to completely integrate that that specific business within the the bigger business but then sometimes with this you lose the authenticity and you lose the purpose and the meaning of that specific brand or what that stands for or to try to keep the meaning and, and the purpose of the, of the brand and what it is uh, and create synergies, whatever that makes sense and they're relevant. So if there, there, there is a relevance in creating synergies in supply chain, in getting uh, ingredients in the distribution system, because basically you have Salesforce going in the same shops, yes, that makes total sense. But basically leave the, bring, uh, the, the brand, you know, um, to live and breathe the essence of it. And, and be, you know, kind of authentic and, and keep driving it. And I think that's, that's the case of Ben & Jerry. That's the case of other brands brought, brought by Unilever and that you, you get this example. I've been part of, a, uh, of one of the, you know, in the moment when Unilever did a Sara Lee acquisition. It was a, a, you know, a company here in Europe and tried to really integrate completely the brands within the, within the business. And it was kind of a, a big failure, I must say. So I think good learning, uh, which had been preserved. Um, so I think, you know, looking also to, to the time, um, to conclude my part about uh, innovation, I would say, get, look to the consumers, look to the market, pay attention to the trends, bring these two, two things, um, you know, kind of connected and closer to, to, to the business uh, and maybe mindful into what you come and there, there to, to try and experiment and go beyond the obvious, you know, go um, and, uh, and experiment maybe, you know, at a smaller scale. That's why basically I hand over here to Daniel to, to kind of guide you quickly through some kind of our, let's say, our last slides about, you know, innovations and how, how do we think companies can thrive no matter the context, no matter the situation, how important innovations and agility um, are in these days. Uh, thank you very much, Liliana. I'll just start off by picking up on Bill's um, uh, acknowledgement that actually Ben & Jerry's is a Unilever uh, product, and yet they're able to operate. That is the ability for the management to be able to understand how they can build resilience and adaptability into their core business. That was precisely the point that you are making, Bill which is organizations are understanding that Ben & Jerry's as a portfolio allows them to be able to have the flexibility to innovate, to adapt, to remain relevant, to hear the customer voice and respond in real time to aspects associated while still benefiting from the aspects of uh, economies of scale, economies of scope, or for the central, what we call the centralized uh, business uh, of Unilever. And that is a, a true example of how to build that aspect of resilience. 
how are you able to, you see, most organizations, like Regana says, are able to proactively plan. The question is, although you have built in aspects around risk identification and mitigation, the question is what happens when you're having to deal with something that you had not yet anticipated, COVID-19? Where is the resilience in your model? Have you overexposed yourself in terms of liquidity? Have you overexposed yourself in terms of uh, your, uh, your stock, your inventory management system? How are you able to adapt and, and, and ensure that this core business is not affected by that particular aspect? And that is the ability to innovate in your business model prior to these unanticipated uh, risks. So as we conclude, we've got to think about how do we do this? We use the word value, uh, value creation, value capture, and value extraction. I was talking to senior executives, uh, 16 of them. And when I asked them to talk about what their core, to identify what their core portfolios were in their business, most of them used a single variable of revenue contribution. And I said to them after we had had a chat, why did you use a single matrix to determine what your core product is and of revenue? And they said, that is the most common matrix that we use. So I said to them, you imagine that you're faced with uncertainty. You're going to look for products that do not necessarily provide the biggest contribution to your revenue. And that is where you might think of downsizing. Yet those products might be leaders in other variables that contribute to the value that you offer your customers. So, for example, Ben & Jerry's is a brand that has been trusted, that has been valued by consumers. So it might not necessarily, I'm, I'm not, I, I don't have the figures of, <laughs> yeah. but Ben & just, just to just to say that, just to put a caveat on that. But it might be able to provide additional value that exceeds revenue contribution. So that value capture soft science. Yes, is, is absolutely important. The ability to look at efficiency and operational extraction, absolutely important because that leads on to how you start setting up areas of innovation. One of them is this new area that I've been involved in, and a few of them have asked me to come and be engaged. It is the creation and why like why I put this where we put this example up is purely the creation of a new economy. We have seen the, the GIG, the shared economy. We have seen the uh, we've seen other economies emerge. However, we've looked at the data economy, we've looked at all these other economies emerge. The B economy is interesting. Some huge companies like huge supermarkets that I'll not mention have made have made uh, have taken positions on things like uh, accepting products that have specific aspects of plastic in them. Now, if you have a leading supermarket that is, that is the main distributor of your products, and it has said that in a year's time, it will, net, it will, not, take, it will, not, put, it will not put products on, on its shelves that have plastic, it leads you to engage in a strategy that was not necessarily proactive, it is reactive. And reactive strategies are littered with a lot of risk exposure. And this new economy that is being created by the B Corp certification is very interesting because they're looking to buy from each other. They're looking to support each other. They're looking to get other businesses to get certification, to look at the wider value that they provide consumers and their, stake, and, and their shareholders. So with those few words, we'd like to go back to the central aspect of the model that we, we engaged in earlier. We're looking at how to manage the 70% core. And I said earlier that this 70% core in unprecedented situations like we are faced now can also be under threat because of the unpredictability and uncertainty that emerges in the market. But that should not stop businesses from trying to consolidate that core business and move to adjacent markets with incremental innovation and that incremental innovation is basically minimizing the exposure and risk associated with that shift. Obviously, the 10% remains that particular aspect of radical innovation that would look to be transformed into the new core of the business as it transitions over time. So I'll hand back over to Bill so that we can have a chat 
Uh, that is <laughs> nice. Uh, so Who doesn't love so Lego? Can... <laughs> uh, yeah, indeed. Uh, <laughs> we do love Lego. Lego is um, part and parcel of. Uh, I, I have got a simulation that I am I am I'm engaged in, and I try to use Lego um, with my students. Oh, that's 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 great news. Um, I'm sold. I'd like to be a student. <laughs> um, wow, that that is really interesting. You know, I, I just to comment a bit on this. Um, you see a lot of companies that are attempting to be reactive to the health situation, the social situation, and you wonder how authentic they are. It's really neat to learn about, and I know about the B Corporation, but just hear it in more of a thorough description of companies that are inherently good and focused and they obviously stepped in to, uh, you know, to do what they do, and it's and it's very authentic. Um, you know, like for example, uh, Ben and Jerry's, Patagonia, others. Uh, it's very clear and very much aware by the consumer that they are authentic, and they can do things that are a little bit uh, controversial, radical, but if they're if it's in their DNA, nobody really has a problem because they already know. And I think that's very interesting, especially for a consumer brand like Tata. Um, and, uh, you know, it's interesting in our in our rehearsal the other day, you had mentioned that um, the beverage, the beverages group, if I'm not mistaken, is kind of a startup or a, a new venture. And it it, it, it kind of give or, or you said that, you know, it, it's a new business mind, a new business for Tata that gives you a chance to grow it. Right. Uh, you acquired some businesses. Is that Am I saying that correctly, or does that give you a chance to play in the new categories? So um, basically, we we have uh, we just launched kombucha in uh, in the ready to drink in the liquids market as part of Gooders brand. So basically, it is uh, yeah we are looking to to uh, extend uh, further into. Um, you know, I I'd like to uh, you know kind of switch gears a little bit, and and I think it's interesting because there will be a time like for example our company uh, I'm at my office you know I. I uh, you know, luckily we have uh, um, uh, established a, a process to accept visitors um, within reason and, and to be here. Um, and we have somewhat of an open office, but it's a more of a hybrid. Um, you know, nevertheless, we will all be back to the office eventually, if not already. And prior to this, uh, this whole uh, trend of the open office was a big deal. Like uh, in, I've been to Unilever in, in London and I remember when they made the switch um, and they literally made the tables. Um, I haven't been there in a little bit, but I remember when they made the open office. And uh, I'm not sure how it's, how it's like today, but um, that was a mass adoption trend. So, you know, what will the new office look? You know, will there be some construction <laughs> or has there been? What, what do you think? Uh, maybe uh, no. uh, Liliano, do you have some thoughts? Um, no, definitely. I think that that will be some some changes. I think the advantages of of open space definitely, are, are, in my view, are, are massive because allow people connect, but allow people interact. And I think this uh, this you know connection um, it's it's basically sparks creativity, sparks bonding, and create teams. And you know teams basically make businesses go uh, work better. And, and you know. Um, um, find better solution to different problems, so on and so forth. Definitely, I would say the current situation will allow, will push us to change our behaviors and will push us, of course, offices need to adapt, you know? So definitely we have kind of uh, regular calls with, with our um, leadership team or I announce all the changes which are going to happen in the office, for example, yeah? So we need to keep this two meters distance, you know, there are some kind of clear rules in terms of how to enter, how to uh, go. Um, unfortunately, for example, we have a, a canteen, it's a very small one, but where teams used to go together to have lunches, that will not be possible, at least in the next future. Yeah. Um, but I would say always, you know, that when there is a, a, a negative side, there is also a positive one. Yeah. So then that definitely will push us to find new ways to engage. Yeah. So um, and to, to cr still, cr still create this, this bonding and create the team spirit, you know. So I think probably that would be the biggest challenge, not necessarily the, the setup of the office, um, but rather how you keep the teams engaged. Probably a big change will be many companies will transition towards more of working from home. 
Um, for example, in Unilever, this used to be a common practice uh, since, you know, two years ago, two, three years ago had been kind of uh, widely embedded. Uh, and, and teams used to be kind of um, advised to work like two, three days per week from home already like three years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that was not, not kind of new news. For other companies, that, that's a transition which probably is going to happen, especially in the, in the context when this proved to work and make sense, you know, and, and be kind of delivered quite well and so continues to, to deliver. Of course, that will be a, a, a challenge for some departments within some companies which will require presence in some specific areas like you know for example r d you need to be in the lab you may not recreate the lab at your house creative teams i think probably um where the, the areas you know and, and parts of a company when i feel that will be a lot of challenges will be um especially a creative agency or or teams where creativity is is very important mm -hmm. so also, if, if you are looking, uh, you know, uh, from from our um, academic and teaching perspective, I was teaching a design thinking class at HALT uh, and when we went online. So honestly, to teach design thinking online, that's that's a challenge. You know, that's, that's really, really tough because based, it's hands on. It's working in a team. Yeah. So and that's, again, creativity in the teams. We find solutions. Are they perfect or not? But still, there are options, yeah. So there are a lot of platforms you can use, and platforms I'm also using part of, of my you know role working with agencies or or other other people. But um, that that'll be you know kind of of things where we need to adapt. Companies need to adapt and need to create options and opportunities, people to adjust and bring some some elements which worked uh, into into the future. You know, I, I, I really like that. Oh, oh yes, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me just mention something there because I think Bill, your own, and Liliana, you're onto something there. Mm -hmm. So now, you imagine I'm a chief executive of an organization, and I have had to go and so for uh, I'm going to have to reorganize the way my my employees engage. But half of my workforce is no longer coming to work. That means the capital expenditure on bricks and mortar needs to be rethought. The question is going to be how how much money are we spending on the building? Are we able to optimize this space into different areas? How are we able to use what we're referring to as open source? Are we able to rent this space out to some to third party? Mm -hmm. Are we able to look at how to optimize this space? Now, I'll give you two real examples. One is that at Holt, we now, we had just re redone our space. In fact, it's an award-winning building in London. When you're in London, Bill, I'll invite you both to the undergraduate. I'm and there. Post One of my favorite cities. What? Well, we've got, we've got fantastic spaces that allow students to effectively sit in groups and, and work. But now because of the pandemic, we're not able to use this space for what it was designed for. So the question is going to be, how do we use that space? And there's several creative ideas. So one of them is to understand whether we could use it for, for example, ensuring that first years and second years are taught online, and then third years and fourth years have more space. So you, you, you can effectively utilize the bricks and mortar and it feeds into optimizing your new revenue streams and stuff like that. So it's it's very interesting model uh, that allows for new uh, new ideas if you're the chief executive or chief financial officer or looking to max it or the, or the founder of the, of the business. You know, it's interesting you said that. So I went to design school here and uh, at the Cleveland Institute of Art and the reason why I chose to go, I wanted to get out of town really bad. <laughs> But uh, going everywhere, I discovered that the school in my own hometown had uh, secured spaces for majors in industrial design. So in foundation, you kind of showed up to class um, in your major. You had a space. You had an office. Correct. That, that is a very good model. Um, yeah. Very interesting. I, I, uh, um, I, I like how you, how you talked about that. I think um, in, in the States, we have a, we have a retailer, Best Buy. And uh, it's a very interesting business model, and it's thriving even in the eras of Amazon. And I've always thought that that was really fascinating because they have this concept of a store within a store. And right. so essentially, they're selling real estate to Samsung, to Apple, right. to HP, and right. so on. And right. something that you were saying is kind of intriguing to me because, and also Liliana, if you in in your in your space, you can re, you don't necessarily need to eliminate the real estate. You know, it doesn't mean we're moving out of the cities. It's you're reorganizing. So you know, do you create an open environment for augmented reality meetings so you can move around or VR? 
Um, do you create leasing space for competitors or partners? Correct. And now yeah. you're changing the water cooler and you're actually improving it. And your co-op petition is there, you know, um, very interesting. Yeah, very yeah interesting. It, it's about it's about probably how you can do um, your your business, how you can repurpose your business if you want and, and or whatever it is, part of it or parts of it, how mm -hmm. it can do different, you know, so you the, the purpose will be still to, you know, for us to to create beverages and sell beverages. But definitely the way we do it, the way we create type of beverages that can adjust in depending on, on what's going on in the market. Mm -hmm. Um, you, you know, it's interesting with this whole stay at home. I, I think one of my favorite silver linings is this virtual uh, medium. Uh, you know, it's, it's weird. So culturally in, in the States, you know, the Midwest and the, and the coasts are a little different. So um, on the coasts, I've found that people are much more or previous to now, they're much more open to doing video calling and technology in the Midwest. We're a little shy. We, we put our cameras <laughs> off. I'm still trying to get my team to turn the cameras on. <laughs> um, but interestingly enough, in the pandemic hit, everybody turned their cameras on because we needed that human uh, yeah. visual. And and so I love the fact that we're all doing video calling now, even as a first option sometimes. And yeah. one of the benefits that I've found uh, from hiring teams, from getting students, from extending your team is now all of a sudden you can hire people outside of your city and get a different perspective. Absolutely. Uh you know, have you seen that as a benefit uh, in either of yours? Uh, maybe Liliana, do you want to talk about this? No, I think basically uh, I've seen this and, and the idea of, of having um, multicultural teams, you know, and, and having diverse teams um, definitely always um, it's it's been bringing benefit. I always work in multiculturalists and, you know, and, and very diverse team, you know, from uh, from different perspectives. I, since my I started my career in Unilever and also here at, at Tata where a very diverse, diverse team, and the transition happened in the last uh, last years. And definitely, you see a lot of benefits because you see different perspectives. Um, you see, you have a lot of different experience, and mm -hmm. you also you you can easily connect. Especially when you talk about driving and developing something which may may be uh, you know then um, uh, delivered at the at the global level or in many countries. So having already somebody coming with experience from a different country or a different region or a different continent brings a lot from the beginning of the of the thinking process. Um, yeah. So if you if you think of something, you know, which may fit into, I don't know, Australian market and having somebody, an, an Australian person within your team, that will make a difference in terms of from where, how you write your concept, you know, the thinking, the wording, you would say, yes, that's English. It's not exactly the same English, you know, so uh, like a, like a British or he wants to have something which will work in the US. Mm -hmm. There will be some small that small, small element which which will make make the difference. You can embed into development of your product and, and the thinking process early, early enough. Plus, now that will bring this this diversity and, and different uh, perspective and also in, in the way how teams engage because that definitely will be different personalities and we know the culture has a quite big impact on the way how we express you know how we are as individuals um so uh, i think that that always uh help and, and definitely i would say diverse teams um are are really much better fitted to succeed um it's just of course important to find the right balance in the way how they're they're managed you know and uh, and make sure that you you encourage and support connection in between these diverse things. I'll just build on that. You see, uh, Bill, you, you asked the question about diversity. I just wanted to show you two things that is really happening in the market as we speak today. Mm -hmm. the, um, the Ivy League schools uh, have had made a transition on when they were offering online education. And that online education had been accepted by the market simply because these institutions had heritage, had what you referred to as authenticity of institution. So I could do an online course at Stanford D School, Design School. Mm -hmm. I could do an online course at Harvard. Now, what the pandemic has done is that it has forced the world to move to these digital platforms. So that means the adoption rate that other institutions were having to have to take to build the credibility, the authenticity 
of their certification of online programs has significantly reduced and it has opened up new markets. So for example, there are markets that were not ideally fed, uh, not, uh, were not seen as, as ripe markets simply because of the cost element of having to travel to London. So for example, Holt has seven campuses around the world, Shanghai, London, Dubai, uh, San Francisco, Boston. So now if we now look at markets in the Middle East, we look at markets in Africa, in Asia, in South America, we're able with this new transition, remember what I said to you, the artificial intelligence and stuff like that. We're now able to see new markets. We're able to come up with a new pricing system. The, the, the student is able to get what we call the trust and authenticity, and the adoption rate has significantly dropped. It reminds me of some of the stuff that we do in class. It took the telephone companies, uh, well, about 60 years to get 50 million company, uh, customers. It took Facebook around about three. It took Pokemon Go nine, <laughs> 19 days. Uh, or oh, Instagram, around about the same. So the adoption rate has changed. And this is the trigger that has led to that reduction in the time that other institutions would be able to authenticate, provide trust within there. So, so <clears throat> sorry about that. So it is, it, is an, it, is an, it is an area that I would really uh, want to tap on because if or if there are executives on this call and they're listening, this is an opportunity for them to exploit the time to innovate in this space because this, as much as it has brought challenges, it has also brought new opportunities that were significant, that were three years, four years away. And that, that is, this is the period in which to exploit those particular opportunities. Wonderful. Yeah, it, it, it is, it is amazing that, the time is now because right. the rules have been kind of thrown out the door. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. You know? yeah absolutely. I, absolutely. I think, I think that is very honest. Also, if you look back, you know, um, this, this um, crisis situations or difficult moments really pushed the companies to be more innovative. You are looking to the, you know, more innovative companies when then being created or, or biggest innovations, they're coming out of the, you know, uh, following a crisis, I would call it crisis moment and any form or shape. So I think that's, that's a, that's a, you know, fantastic opportunity for everyone to, to rethink business, to rethink innovations, to, to go beyond the out of comfort zone. So basically I think that's really the, the biggest benefit. We need all to go out of our comfort zone. Yep. Uh, so, and, and it's next, how you, how you use that creativity at each individual has, you know, each business has inside. To, to go with something new, different, which will allow it to um, to develop further. You know, we, we've been doing these, um, uh, at our company, we've been doing these virtual roundtable sessions, which uh, um, I'll definitely keep you posted on. But we had this last one where um, one of our panelists from a company called Medline, um, uh, she is uh, the chief direct, uh, director of innovation. It's a medical supply company in the States. And she said a really great quote. She said, get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Yeah. All right. You know, <laughs> absolutely. absolutely yeah. yeah. I, I thought that was great. Um, you know, and it's it's just it's just the way it is. I mean, you know, you know, be careful what you wish for because if you're in innovation, it's it's uh it's it's never gonna get like there's never gonna be a uh okay, now we can cruise. It doesn't work like right. that. No, no, there is no cruise. <laughs> Need to go full speed now. Oh no, no. yeah, right. Yeah, just it's more about Okay, what's next? <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 exactly. Um, so we're happy we got about 15 minutes left. Uh, anybody if, uh, like to ask some questions? If not, we'll just keep kind of moving here. Uh, again, I got uh, Liliana from uh, Tata Consumer Products and Danielle from uh, Holt International Business School, uh, both uh, based in London. Um, and I'm uh, Bill Nottingham, your moderator. I, I'm based in the United States. And uh, really having a, a really fun conversation with the two about innovation and uh, I'm sure the three of us have come up with lots of ideas turning in our heads for uh, what's to happen next. But um, I have a couple thoughts. We did talk about this idea of, you know, Liliana, you said it right when you said that companies that are going to be working together, that compete with each other. Um, I've, we, we've recently can be using this word co-opetition. And I, I, I think that it's, it's this ultimate mashup of companies that, you know, uh, who's, who, who, who's your competition? Are they competition? Can we all win? Uh, you know, the B company methodology, the 
all these things we're finding. Um, you know, what, what what examples have you seen that you found were pretty interesting um, that you could share? Maybe some stories, uh, um, lessons learned. Yeah, I, I think I think that is basically. Um, I would say that is a bit uh, older one, like like a few years back, more than ten years back. Uh, linked very much with the um, with the tea culture. So you know, the tea is is cultivated somewhere in in Africa, Kenya, Malawi, big countries in in producing tea. Of course, India and China. Um, but again, the the main issue there it is uh, it's it's very difficult to really control and check, you know the how how the tea is produced you know and then go to the people and and make sure that they are fairly treated you know and you don't have i don't know um children used to to pick up the tea and then all all these kind of things you know in terms of the welfare of the of the people were of the workers there so um on um and definitely what, what happened was uh companies were really looking into um how we can can make sure that basically we we are fair we are true you know and we we really bring bring this what is the culture at the base of our culture our values uh, also in relation to with our partners but again getting tea from anywhere in the world and especially from that specific countries was was a little bit difficult to ensure the same values are are there and also you don't get it from one single garden you know then it's easier because you can create a partnership. So um, again, um, there were different, you know, um, Tata Global Beverages at that time tried this, Unilever tried this, you know, because that's what companies was, you know, really rooted in into the company itself. Uh, they realized that's not possible one single company to do too much and have a the impact was very very limited. So like this basically had been creating the ethical tea partnership. Uh, where all these companies, you know, um, sourcing tea from from different regions, put some their their uh, kind of energies together and forces together, you know, and, and resources together to support and create um, some some uh, first a clear standard in terms of how we basically take uh, and uh, kind of acknowledge companies um, or tea plantations which you know that they are uh, delivering against this, these requirements, but then how we support them. Again, a company, you know, cannot support enough, but putting all the, the you know, kind of the, the support and resources from different companies, they succeed to really upscale and, and extend the area where where the, the that specific conditions had been clearly implemented in terms of, you know, the um, the wages, the pay, the payments of the, you know, the condition, the work conditions, so on and so forth. You know, and then basically that became like a standard and industry standard that, uh, the, the production of tea should be, uh, you know, um, kind of endorsed by this and then had been associated with Rainforest Alliance. Uh, again, an alliance. The two things, uh, you know, in order to get Rainforest Alliance, you need to source from some specific areas which are being certified by the Ethical Partnership Tea. So, you, you know, the, the things work together and then are coming towards the, the, the other people with a guarantee that, yes, whatever we source from from there, it, we know where it's coming from, how that people are treated, uh, all, you know, the conditions. That's that's an example about, you know, how you uh, you can interact and pe uh, companies can work together. That's not about competition there. We all want to deliver the best for our, our consumers. Um, and probably it's the current, in the current context, when we see uh, beside, you know, the classical um, example about pharmaceutical companies working together to create a vaccine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's, that's again, no competition. The, the, there is a clear um, objective, a scope for all of, of them, you know, to, to deliver uh, a vaccine, which will allow us to, to kind of reduce the, the impact of this, of this virus. Mm -hmm. Or on the other hand, another, another situation it is, not necessarily competitors, but I would say partnership, unexpected partnerships, mm -hmm. which again came up like, a, you know, following a, a, a high pressure in the market and difficult situation. And then you have the, uh, the producer of uh, alcoholic drinks working together with cosmetic producers <laughs> oh, to create yeah. a hand sanitizer. Yeah. So would you, you wouldn't expect, you know, a um, company like, I don't know, Diageo to work with L'Oreal and create a hand sanitizer, uh, which is not necessarily part of the you know the the core business of of any of the of the businesses but was was something which which existed had been created and probably that can be something which may be explored further you know and and develop not necessarily only for for this specific purpose 
but there is still need for such a product across the globe in different other areas how we can support support this so these are kind of i would say a few examples where where uh, you know you see companies working together to deliver um to to towards a, a common purpose wonderful examples daniel you have some thoughts Yes, I'll just build on those examples. I think uh, Bibiana picked up on relevant examples. I'll just go into some of the, the motivations for why companies should engage in this cooperation and yet they're still competing with each other. Because I, I've always said that in areas of uncertainty, there are fundamentals, I tell my graduate students um, who are working in, in huge companies, HSBC, Reuters and all that. And they come in from the office and I say to them, if you're not able to manage uh, aspects around your operating base, you put your business and you expose your business to significant risk. And it's a fundamental business concept. And there are different ways that one of them, I mean, that all these can manifest. One of those areas is in inventory or managing your inventory. So the example that Liliana got uh, talked about in terms of Diageo working with L'Oreal. The, the ability for organizations to look for common synergies that they can then look for revenues that they can share or that they can then actively compete at a different stage within the supplier within within the within the cycle is vital because i don't think that businesses that fail to pivot and become flexible to adapt to these type of models will succeed in the medium to long term. They will find new pressures. And I'll tell you why they're going to find new pressures. The pressure is not going to necessarily be in market space, but it's going to be on which markets do you fight in? Where are the margin thresholds that you're fighting in? If you're able to fight in lower margin thresholds, that means I would suggest that your business thinks very carefully about whether it wants to continue that portfolio. Because number one, you are so you're so exposed to disruptors because that is the market that they will first enter mm -hmm. with non-consuming customers and they'll improve on their performance thresholds. Number two, you are, you are limited in the way that you can move into a higher threshold. Now, this has happened in several industries. I'll give you two to think about. One, the automobile industry. Today, I can line up five cars and if I remove the badge, you'll be hard pressed to find out which of these, which of these cars, which of these cars is is for the except for a Tata, right? All oh, right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> except for yes, except for Tata, yes. So, and you can see that organizations have, and it has happened in areas around whether you're talking about transfer of technology from F1 to road cars, uh, moving to uh, flappy gearboxes. Uh, if in, engine efficiencies around uh, electric engines and stuff like that. So the question is going to be, how does your business model adapt to create the flexibility to, to allow for this co-competition or cooperative competition that, that it essentially be, can become your future proofing of your growth or the way that you continue to grow your business? I come from Uganda. I have seen... I'm going to talk about one of the competitors of Unilever and Tata. Uh, <laughs> I have seen a company called uh, Johnson & Johnson that have actively engaged in new technologies that they're using for handheld uh, medical devices. I know that, uh, um, Bill, you, you produce a few of those yourself uh, in your company, but it is, it is unbelievable at how they have transformed lives. And what is happening is very interesting, is that they have created additional models because most African consumers cannot afford that technology. They have created third parties that are engaged in corporate responsibility to purchase that technology and provide it to the recipients. And that means that they're able to sell high-tech technology that is, a, that, is, that is adapted to this particular industry. So you find Johnson & Johnson working with CDC, working with the government of Uganda and working with other competitive local, local competitors to be able to deliver. And that is fundamental. And they're getting into a space which is huge in terms of market size and they have found a model that allows them to grow their, their revenues. Mm, interesting. So they're almost like, um, wow, that, that's a fascinating model. So they're, they're creating, uh, so are they almost licensing to these companies? 
I, I believe they will. At, at this point, they're not. And it reminds, I don't want to talk about it because it will be a bit controversial, but it reminds me of how the pharmaceutical companies dealt with the HIV pandemic, uh, the HIV disease. What they did is that some of the big companies created antiretroviral drugs. The, most, the, the, the biggest population that was suffering was in developing countries, but most people could not afford these drugs. So what did they do? They went and they went and they went through the global fund, whereby individuals would be now the the structure remains the same. The structure of the model. The question is, who are the players within that model? Are they private? Mm -hmm. Are they so? Are you doing a PPL? Are you doing a private public partnership? Are you doing um, so? And you can engage some of your competitors. And those competitors, as you rightfully point out, Bill, at a, at a later stage, if I was some of those competitors, I would seek for a licensing agreement to be able to then drive either the manufacturing or assembly, if not, of these of these technologies. You know, it's interesting. So we got about uh, six minutes left. And yep. one, of, one of the reasons I was so excited for this conversation is it was an international conversation, you know, between Correct. where you're located, where I'm located, where you're from. Uh, where you work, um, I think that more companies need to think about this international discussion because it's interesting, even right now, I think many of our countries are speaking about, them, about themselves within their walls because we can't travel, but then also just we have our own problems. But um, 